everybody for coming. This is a really exciting and important event for us. Um, if you've never been to the bookstore, there is uh, an email that's going around right now. We have a weekly newsletter that goes out every Wednesday and talks about what um, events we have and what sales and what we're doing and um, anything else that we got going on. Uh, next week, on Thursday, um, we're showing a film called Who Bombed Judy Berry? Um, it's about environmental and labor activist Judy Berry, who was um, a bar, a bomb went off in her car, <laughs> and, uh, and is very um, strongly, yeah, very suspect that the FBI did it, and so this is a um, it's really good film to about Judy Berry. And tonight, we are really excited to have Helen Benedict here. Um, her work was the inspiration for the film we're also going to be showing called The Invisible War. And um, afterwards, uh, Helen's going to talk about her work and then we'll show the film. And then afterwards, Helen's going to do um, a Q&A. Mm -hmm. And we have her books here, uh, The Movie Soldier and Sandy, two of her books. And she'll be more than happy to sign copies afterwards. Um, we have to thank the Peace Center uh, for uh, helping uh, co-sponsor the event. Also, there's been a lot of people who have donated time or money to make this event possible, and we really owe everybody a huge um, debt of thanks for that. So, um, I think that's it. Without any further ado, please welcome Helen Benedict. It's a great audience. Well, thank you so much for, for having me here. I'm really honored, and it's great to get out of New York City for a bit and come up to the real world. Um, and and um, I'm really thrilled to see such a turnout as well. Uh, speaking here reminds me, I've spoken at Revolution Books in, in um, Berkeley and in LA and in New York at the different branches. And there was one time when I had come straight from speaking at West Point uh, to, shall we say, a hostile audience, uh, and the, to Revolution Books, where it was completely the opposite. And it, was a, it was a very funny juxtaposition, but I feel very at home. Yeah. Um, I thought I would just start off by talking about how I got into the subject of women in the military and how they're treated and what their experiences are. And it all started when, I think I could say this safely within these walls, um, I was on going on marches against the invasion of the uh, Iraq war. And uh, I met, oh, at one of them, I was at vigil, actually, with my daughter, my 12-year-old daughter, who I was busily, uh, at the time she was 12, busily politicizing. And we would go to all these marches together. She's for somebody who wasn't born in the 60s, she's quite a veteran of marches. Uh, um, and there was a vigil, you've probably been to this sort of thing, you know, where the names of the dead are, are read out, both of soldiers and, and Iraqis, and there's a drum after each one. And there was one young man, this is in 2004, one year into the war, who kept, who kept reading all the Iraqi names, and afterwards he explained that he knew how to pronounce them because he'd just come back from Iraq is a, with the army. And then he began to tell us things about what was going on that we were not reading anywhere in 2004. About not only the slaughtering of civilians for no reason, but the lack of armor, the lack of safety procedures, the fact that they had canvas-sided Humvees they were driving around in. And I thought, you know, how amazing to meet an Iraq War veteran when most of them are still over there in Iraq. And how different to hear what a soldier has to say about the war as opposed to what all my friends have to say and the pundits on TV. I already knew what they all thought. So I began to, to follow him. And I went to an early meeting that he and a few other people were giving to just tell the public about the war. At this point, interest was so high that there were 12 people in the audience. Um, and in the back of the room were these two young women standing there silently. So I went up to them and I said, you veterans too. They looked really young to me. They looked like little girls. And one of them said, yeah, 
I was in Iraq for 11 months. I was a gunner. I was shot at every night. Oh, God. But when I talk about it, nobody listens and nobody believes me. And you know why? Because I'm a female. So I said, being a journalist, I said, I'll listen. <laughs> what, what's it like to be a woman in combat? I already knew that, that, you know, that there was this Pentagon ban against women in ground combat. So, but I also already knew that in the Iraq war, because of the nature of the war, which is basically a guerrilla war, lots of women are in combat. And she said, this is the first thing she said to me. She said, well, the first thing you've got to understand is that if you're a girl in the military, the guys only let you be three things. A bitch, a hoe, or a dyke. You're a bitch if you won't sleep with them. You're a hoe if you've got only one boyfriend. And you're a dyke if they don't like you, so you can't win, no matter what. And then the other young woman next to me said, yeah, that's exactly what it's like for me. So I thought, wow, you know, if this is true, if this is beyond, goes beyond the experience of just these two young women, we're sending our young women to war, take, they're taking all the same risks of life and limb and mind as the men, and they're being treated like this. I need to look into this. So I spent the next three years interviewing some 40 women veterans of the Iraq war, all over the country, all different ages, walks of life, all different ethnic groups, etc. And I heard not only the stories of combat and war, but I heard about how they were being treated by their male comrades. And about one in three would say to me um, <coughs> that they were sexually assaulted or raped by a, uh, somebody they were, who was supposed to be watching their back in battle. And they all, 100% said, I was constantly, relentlessly harassed by the men and not in a nice way. So I then looked into the statistics because it turned out that all of them <coughs> since Vietnam, both the military and the, the Department of Veterans Affairs had been studying sexual assault in the military and they had all these sociologically and statistically significant studies buried in their database, something which uh, was getting, they were getting very little publicity. So I dug into that and I found that the statistic echoed pretty much what I've been finding among my 40 soldiers. A 30% rate of rape, that's almost one in three, and a 99% of sexual harassment among women serving in the military from the men they were serving with. So I had the statistical backups and I had the stories. Um, and from that I wrote a bunch of articles first. And the first one was, appeared in Salon and it was called The Private War of Women Soldiers. Now the press occasionally covered this scandal. There was the Tailhook scandal, there was the Aberdeen. You know, every proving grounds, every few years there, there would be a story would break about the sexual harassment of soldiers and there'd be a big buzz about it and then it would die down again. But um, nobody had been writing about it in the current Iraq and Afghanistan wars. Um, and to find out that this was happening in such high numbers at the same time as more women were serving in Iraq, by the way, and have served in Iraq in the current Iraq war, uh, than all uh, American wars put together since World War II. And more women had been killed and more women had been wounded. So the Iraq war represented a huge change of the role of women in the military and, and therefore in our whole society. And at the same time, there's this ghastly rate of abuse. Um, <clears throat> out of that first article, Amy Ziering and Kirby Dick, the people who made this movie, came to me and said, has anybody done a documentary on your topic? And I said, a few people have approached me, but nothing's happened. So they said, well, can we interview you and read more of your stuff? And they took it from there and they ended up with this film, but it only just came out. Meanwhile, you know, meanwhile many years were passing. So I wrote this book, The Lonely Soldier, um, which has, I, I took five of the main, five soldiers to concentrate on, because you can't tell 40 stories and expect people to follow 40 stories in detail. And I really wanted 
the reader to get to know the, the women so that they weren't just like talking victims, you know, just heads saying, this happened to me, this happened to me. I wanted them to come across as the full human beings they are. Um, so I start off with their childhood, so you understand what led them to enlist. Mm -hmm. Then I take you through the, how they're trained, you know, in, in boot camp and AIT. And then I take them to war and then follow them home again. So you can see what war did to them, you can see what the experiences they went through, how it changed them, and you can understand the whole arc of their experiences. Um, so those are the five sort of main soldiers in this. Ellie Painted Crow, who's on the cover, is one of them, Native American from California. Uh, there's Michaela, who's a Mexican-American from California. There's Terrace, who's African-American from D.C. Um, and some of those are older women who'd had a whole army career by the time I found them. And then there were some really young ones, too, um, from all over the country, you know, who joined as very young girls. And uh, sometimes in response to 9-11, sometimes for economic reasons, all the same reasons that, that Men and boys join the military. You know. Sometimes family, military family and pride, dead end towns, want an adventure, want to prove yourself, you know, need to get out of, out of an abusive home. That's a very high one for men and women joining the military. Um, so there's no between why men and women join the military, but there is a difference between the way they're treated once they're there. Um, and I'm not going to give you all the horrifying statistics and the details because you're going to see that in the movie. But I will tell you about why, even after I'd heard these stories about women being afraid to go to the latrines for fear of being raped by men on their own side and coming, you know, sometimes dying of dehydration because they wouldn't drink in the desert so they could avoid the toilet. Women carrying knives, of course they all had weapons that trained soldiers, but to have an extra knife for, as they put it, the, the men on my own side. Women saying to me, I'm more afraid of my so-called comrades than I am of the enemy, things like that. Um, I, I then made a play out of it, which has been traveling around campuses and veterans' museums and things to be performed. It's all in the words of the women soldiers themselves, and I wove it into the same kind of arc before, during the war and after, um, and that's, that's been a good educational tool, and I think sometimes veterans act in it, which I think has been uh, a really good experience. And it still wasn't enough. There was still more to say. So then I had to write a novel, because I am more of a novelist these days than a journalist, because I wanted to get deep inside the soul of what it was like to be a soldier, be at war, be a woman, and, and the other side, be an Iraqi which nobody has been talking about. So um, I knew I had to go into fiction because sometimes as I was interviewing people, and I know I began to interview Iraqi refugees too, they hit, you know, they'll tell you these terrible things they've been through, their children killed, their rapes, etc. And they'll tell you an amazing amount. I was so honored by the courage it took to tell me these stories, the courage it takes to speak out like this. It's very hard for civilians to understand. How many of you are veterans or are connected with the military? Mm -hmm. Well, you, you really know. You know, you can be seen as a traitor, you can be seen as, a, um, as letting the, your, your side down, breaking a kind of code of secrecy, a code of brotherhood, etc., a code of sisterhood. It takes a lot of courage. But sometimes, quite often, even with all this openness, the women would hit a wall where they couldn't talk anymore. You know, their eyes would fill with tears, or they'd start to tremble, or they'd have panic attacks, or, or make jokes. Soldiers are great at cracking jokes. <laughs> with a great sense of humor, it's part of survival, I think, would you say. I don't mean just soldiers, I'm also talking, I'm talking about all branches. I also interviewed Marines, people in the Navy and the Air Force. Um, <coughs> And I knew that when they fell silent, that it was in those silences that the real story lay, that the real secrets lay, this real story of how a soul experiences war. And I wanted to get to that 
that soul. And that's why, that's where I could go into fiction, where I wouldn't have to push someone or re-traumatize them, uh, you know, or exploit, feel I was exploiting them. But where I could take everything I'd heard from real people and mix it up with my imagination and my, you know, just my natural human sympathy and really go deep inside what it's like to have been a, a woman soldier in Iraq and an Iraqi woman who interacts with them and whose family is so affected. So that's what Sans Queen is. And I think, um, how am I doing for time? Uh, I just want to point out a couple of really important things. Uh, you will see as you watch the film that one of the great issues here is, well, we, I'll rephrase this. The problem doesn't stop with the rape. That's just the start of the trauma. Unlike in civilian life, you cannot go home from the office when you're in the military. You have to stay there living with your assailant. Day after day, hour after hour, month after month, and sometimes year after year. There's no escaping. Um, the beginning of the war, a lot of so the bases were so primitive that everyone was just sharing a tent. So you couldn't even get away at night in your sleep. Remembering too that in Iraq, at one in ten troops was a woman. So women were, and generally in the military, it's 14%. So women are vastly outnumbered, and you're not, you know, you're not deployed to be with other women. You're deployed according to your job. So women were very often serving alone with 60 men or with one or two women, other women only, and they weren't necessarily out all day with them. Uh, so the isolation is extreme. Um, and I began to think and ask the soldiers, wait a minute, if you're alone a lot like this and you're isolated and you have a traumatic thing happen to you, you're attacked, who can you turn to? Who can you trust? And over and over again I heard, nobody. And I thought, but the great compensation for all soldiers through the whole of time has always been that bond of brotherhood, you know, mm -hmm. we've been the way you get so close to each other because of going through all this horror together. Mm -hmm. Imagine going through all that and not having that bond. Mm -hmm. I mean, how cruel is that? That's why I called it the lonely soldier, because uh, I thought this was such a deep tragedy that, that women or any soldier, it's not just women, of course, uh, some 12% of men are sexually assaulted in the military too. And we know, you know, don't ask, don't tell, it's finally been repealed, but that was a, an official tool of bullying, you know, officially condoned way of bullying people to the point of suicide, which helped sexual assailants feel that they were given a license to bully people in that way too, whether they were picking on men or women. Um, so that loneliness is so deep, you will hear it echoed in, in the film, and you will see how what happens to women when they try to report the rapes, when they try to find justice or find protection. The military is, on the whole, uh, a culture of rape and a culture of victim blaming. Mm -hmm. And the usual response is you ask for it or you fail to protect yourself, you're a soldier, it doesn't matter with you. Or you're, or you're lying, you're letting the side down. Or, you, you, know, I, or you, you entered the military because you know you're man hungry. So is that what you want? Mm -hmm. Things like that get said. Now I do want to give you one thing, I've, a piece of hope that I think is really important. Aside from what's happening, there are some reforms going on you'll hear about. Um, in the end, how how a survivor of rape is treated comes down to her immediate superiors, her friends, and their officers, especially the sergeants, though. Like, the closer the, the superiors are to the person uh, who's been victimized, the more they, power they have to affect what happens to her. If you're lucky enough to have a commander who respects women and really cares about this issue, mm -hmm. you might get treated right, and that does happen. But 
the terrifying thing is the rules are that every time you report a rape, it has to be reported to the, up the chain of command, even if you report it anonymously. 33% of the commanders that get the rape reported to them are friends of the rapist, and 25% of them are the rapist. Mm -hmm. So you have to report your rape to your rapist. Mm. You're really going to get a lot of help that way. Yeah, right. mm. So um, one of the things that is happening now, partly as a result of the film, partly as a result of a lawsuit, which also came out of my work, which I'm terribly proud of and excited about, is to change the way the judicial system works in these cases and to try and bring in a civilian system to break that chain of command so that people aren't going to further traumatize rape victims in order to save their own careers, which is a huge problem at the moment. What percentage of the women you interviewed were enlisted versus officers? Um, most of them were enlisted, but I, uh, I talked to a few officers and going all the way up to a general as well, quite a few. But I don't actually, I can't give you a percentage. But the, my main five characters are all enlisted, although some of them are NCOs, some of them are sergeants. Um, and the off then the other women I interviewed, including all the officers and those other 40 women, they weave, their voices weave in and out. But I didn't make sure to, to go all the way up and all the way down the ranks because I wanted to get the spectrum. And, uh, you know what goes on in military academies against women? It's not as if it's any better than what goes on in the bases and on the ground. And we've been hearing more about that in the press lately. Um, there, I will, another little, little sign of hope is when I spoke at West Point, I said there was an atmosphere of hostility, but to tell the truth, it came from the professors, the officers. Uh, it did not come from the cadets, and given that the cadets are mostly young men, I found this very heartening. They were really there with me, and one of them stood up and said, you know, we have this phrase, uh, true, we use for female cadets, true is short, or trow, short for trousers, which is short for being, you know, a fat, lazy bitch who doesn't, who doesn't look good in, in the cadet trousers. And this is the term we use routinely for, um, you know, for the female cadets. And I did a study, said this boy, because when we came in as freshmen, uh, people kind of laughed that term off and didn't think it was serious. And by the time they're seniors, we were using it to hurt women with. We were using it derogatory. Oh, so I, I think we really learn more misogyny in here than and the professors were saying, no, you brought it in from the streets. I know what kind of places you come from, really. Um, and they infuriated the cadets. And, that, that, and then there were cadets from all the military academies. And then a young Navy guy stood up, and a young Air Force guy stood up, and a young Coast Guard. And they said, it's the same with us. We all, we all have this derogatory word we use, and we, we think it's wrong. And that was coming from the young guys. So I'm hoping that as the generations change and the old guard age out of the military, it will also help usher in. And there will be more women in the military, whether we like it or not, because the recession is, the economy is driving more women proportionally than the men into the military too. So we'll see there's some hope there, other than, of course, the great solution, which is to get rid of the military altogether. <laughs> everybody to be as generous as possible. We have a lot of expenses with this event, with licensing, bringing Helen, so anything you have is really appreciated. Yes. Um, ah. I want to ask Granny Kipling what the percentage of the men that are committing the rape are. Is it 
fifteen percent up to forty five percent? Nobody knows since most of them are never caught or never yeah. fingered, so um, there's no way of measuring what percentage they can measure what percentage of men committed sexual assault and were you know prosecuted for them before they came in the military and that was fifteen. But um, as we said in the movie there's a re repeat crime, it's a repetitive crime. So even even if you don't have that many numerically you have you have them doing what's called three hundred each in a lifetime. But um, as long as you know only at the latest statistics are that eighty six percent of assaults are never reported. So if they're if they're not reported, then how can we find out how many men are doing it? Is there any way that if you're a civilian and have a faculty by military personnel that you could report it? You report it to to your local police, not to the military. Um, yeah. it, it does make a difference whether the, the military is active due to or a veteran. But as a civilian, and you know, you you're, you can use a civilian system, which works better. Well, it, it doesn't work very well anyway. Um, but you can also, you know, that's. I might ask. Let's talk afterwards. I might have some other ideas. Okay. Yes. Uh, Mr. Parker, the one where she had the knife in her hand, I heard, I had to say, what did she say? Because everyone laughed. She said, Jesus is in love, but sometimes you need a little bit more. Jesus, <laughs> yes. Jesus protects you, but sometimes you need a bit more. <laughs> well, I wanted to know, my, my question is like, if, if, they, if they harm, the, if they use their military weapons, to harm the rapist, how would that go down? And does it go down? Like, because they talk about people who retaliate. She would get the, uh, uh, you would get into so much more trouble for shooting or stabbing a fellow soldier than, you, than any rapist ever gets into. I mean, as it is, um, women are not only the stories you heard in the movie about the way they're punished for reporting, but I've talked to women who, um, Went AWOL or wouldn't come, you know, they went home for R&R, &R, which is rest, and they didn't go back because they knew they were going to be redeployed with a wet rapist, mm. were court martialed and put in prison. So the rapist was put in prison for just avoiding the rapist. Um, so there's, yeah, you would get into a whole lot more trouble. Mm. You, you know, and, and the, the military has a death penalty too, so if you murder another, a fellow, you're not going to get off because you're saying he raped you. It's very, very unlikely. I want to say about the lawsuit, because there's been another oh, yeah. chapter of that since the movie was made. Uh, Susan Burke will not give up. Um, she is come, She is now suing the military, the Marine, <coughs> sorry, the Marine Corps, Corps headquarters in D.C. For, on behalf of those women we saw who were in the elite core, if you remember that part of it. Um, so she's she's going to just keep on trying until she find, finally finds a judge who doesn't say it's an occupational hazard to be raped in the world. Did you catch that? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Deeply shocking. Yeah. Um, it was not. It wasn't the Supreme Court, but it was a yeah. It was a judge that that case got brought to and dismissed it, and that was the end of that round. But she's just going to keep trying and trying and moving it from court to court until she finds somebody reasonable. Yeah. Do they let women know that are applying to get into the military? <laughs> 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 it's up to us. It's up to us to do that. All of us. I mean, this is, it's getting, one of the good things about having books and movies out is that, and, and having newspaper articles is the word is spread. Uh, you know, people are more and more aware of this now. It's, but, you know, most people who join the military stay like that girl did in the diner. I can look after myself. You know, that only happens to girls who ask for it. There's always some kind of justification. If you're determined to go into the military, it's very hard to stop somebody who feels that. Right. So it said we had to let a took away the lieutenants uh, to prosecute, and if he took it away, where did he give it? Where did it go? It goes to civilian court now. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, it does. Yeah. And so that's but, uh, what we wanted. Right? That's what we wanted. So that's a triumph. Mm -hmm. so, so right. when the, if there, somebody's right from the military, they can just go to the jury court and afford it? Uh, um, the decision, yeah. I'm not really clear on this because it's just happened. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just know that it now means that the commander of the unit that the rape happened to no longer has the power to decide whether to investigate or not. So he no longer has the power to, to, to shut down the case to protect himself. And that, that's a major achievement. But I would like to see at the back of my book I have a chapter of reforms, and one of the things I'd like to see is, uh, you know, is hotlines to rape crisis centres and counsellors that are non-military, which at least so that soldiers can call off base and get help without having to deal with this whole machine. Mm -hmm. That works in home bases. It can work, but if you're in Iraq or Afghanistan, that's a lot of problem. <laughs> Yes. What about uh, uh, civilians in other countries? Mm -hmm. oh, yes. Because I heard this one military man he's had, he had a hard time oh. connecting with his wife two year, over two years. And he, he witnessed rape on young children. Like, yeah. people, like in Afghanistan and Iraq are actually selling their children because they need to feed the family so they will choose the female child to sell to. To, to, to the military that is stationed there so they can survive. Yeah. Once so in the blue moon, you know, uh, a military serviceman will be prosecuted for raping a civilian, but a lot of it goes on and never gets reported or gets covered up. Mm -hmm. and, and traumatizes the, the men who are really there for a good reason yeah. to serve our country. Like, he's traumatized by the stuff that he's oh, yeah. witnessed. Oh, yeah. But he couldn't turn, he, he wasn't checked either because oh, if yeah. he said something about what he mm -hmm. saw. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so he has a daughter and a son, and he's just like super overprotective. Mm -hmm. Um, not really connecting with them, like, mm -hmm. like children, they cry. What do you cry for? Like, do you know what, you know, what he's seeing kids crying about? You know, it's just like... Mm -hmm. Well, that makes me, that, I'm glad you brought that up, because I, it's always important to remind everyone, especially after that film, that most guys in the military are not rapists, and most guys in the military are not bad guys. I've had... In my play, for example, I had, um, you. you know, I had quite a lot of male, male veterans come to the show and they'd be very moved and they, you know, they want to help. Um, but peer pressure is really, really strong. It's very hard to stand up against a whole culture that picks on women and be the lone guy who says, I think this is wrong. Mm -hmm. Really, really hard. Yes. Yeah, I was wondering um, when when the victims went to visit the legislators and uh, how, you know, politicians. Or, can any real action, can any real good? Do you see it coming from? I mean, they went there to do that, to lobby, yeah. to get. And I know Representative Spire is, is the is a Jack huge is advocate for all victims, men and women. And she wants to have some formal <coughs> hearings and things like that to bring attention. She has 80 legislators on her side. Right. But where do you see that going? Well, is I that, think, I think it, it has been one of the reasons why Finette has changed this policy. Okay. That came. But I have to say, you know, Congress has been pressing the military on this for, for years. Years. decades. Yeah. I've testified yeah. to Congress twice. Yeah. I mean, they've heard this for years yeah. and years, and the military is it's in the universe unto itself with its own criminal yeah. justice system. And they're amazingly defiant, as you saw, and, and amazingly able. To, to ignore the mandates from Congress, mm -hmm. I mean, which is an interesting thing going on in a, in a democracy. And I'm worried that we'll just, this will just turn out to be another round, like yeah. we saw with Tailhook, and not really yeah. get yeah. much mm -hmm. further, mm -hmm. which is why the filmmakers have been taking this to Capitol Hill and taking it to the DOD. Yeah. And you know, pushing it on them and, and getting it further than all the testimonies we've been given. Uh, oh, I'll tell you one bizarre story that happened to me. I was testifying to the Committee on Veterans Affairs. The whole I wrote an article called "Why Soldiers Rape," 
because we spend an awful lot of time looking at the victims and not very much on, you know, how do we train men to be rapists in this society, the ones who are? What are we doing wrong as a society, to, and why do men rape, etc.? Why do soldiers rape their own comrades? And that, so they had this committee, which was all about the rape culture in the military and why men rape in the military and what could be done. And there were all these PhD experts and people who counsel rapists and so on. And at one point, the head of the committee, and I've forgotten his name, said, stop, stop. And he looked into the C-SPAN camera and he said, I just want it on record that there is nothing anti-military about this hearing. And then he carry on. <laughs> Very, very tough guy. But, but what do you think? Is like the, what is the answer to change, to make major change? That I mean, what do you think is the answer? To well, I think one of the main, the, one of the main answers is is to is to address the, the way the criminal justice system works in the military and take it take the power out of their hands. Mm -hmm. But we've got to get more civilians in there training, training the rape counselors in the military. I mean, now it's mandated that if you report a rape, you get a counselor. But those counselors, a lot of them have been trained to investigate you as the criminal. Yeah. And they're not really your advocate at all. They're, they're told to assume that the women are all lying. That doesn't help anyone. So that whole, the whole training thing needs to be changed. It, there is some progress being made on that. But we also got a really much larger problem, you know, which is the sexism in society at large and the, and the military lack of respect for women. Uh, just a deep lack of respect to all the way to hate. Because that's where, you know, just to remind you all, as I'm sure you all know, but you know, rape is an act of of violence and domination, not an act of lust or pent up lust. Mm -hmm. And it's about squashing someone down and degrading them and feeling your power. Yes. Men, a lot of men are very threatened by women in the military. I mean, if they, what is the mo what what more macho job in our society is there than being a soldier? It's even more macho than being, you know, a cop or a fireman. Um, and so, in the eyes of our society, you know, it's always been associated with men. Women are coming in and, and they're damn good at it. And this is really threatening a lot of people and that's part of it. That could pass out with generational change. Mm -hmm. is, is, it remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. Yes? Is this common in the military other countries that have women? Yes. Um, no other countries have studied it as much as we have, mm -hmm. so it's hard to really compare. And then other countries have even more secrecy around their military. They don't all, all have you know, mm -hmm. some of the constitutional amendments to um, mm -hmm. the journalists trying to investigate. Mm -hmm. For example, in the British military, once you've signed in the once you've enlisted, you sign the gag order not just for while you're on active duty the way it is here, mm. but for your whole life. Oh. You can't tell. You're not supposed to be able to tell any journalist or any writer the truth of anything that went on in the military, mm. ever, for your whole life. So that makes it very hard for, yes. for anybody to investigate these sorts of things. Although, but nonetheless, stories have come out. I've seen them come out of Italy and the UK mm. and you know, some other countries where there is co-ed. Uh, you know, militaries, but a lot of countries don't have co militaries yet. Yes, in the back. Well, I was just going to ask specifically, is there any literature about Israel? I mean, yeah, I always get asked that question, and it is a good question. Um, there are some profound differences, one being, the main one being, of course, that there's a draft for everyone, so the military, so their women make up 50% of the military instead of only 14%. So the lonely aspect, in that sense, doesn't apply. But women are also banned from ground combat there, as they are here. So they are also seen to a certain extent as second-class soldiers, as they are here, which affects their status and how they're regarded. From what I've read and, and seen reported, um, and I'm not an expert on this, it seems that the amount of, re of sexual assault within the Israeli military is about the same as it is in huh. civilian life or office life, you know. There are always, with any kind of hierarchy of command, there will be people who abuse their power. 
Mm. It seems to be not as extreme as here. Not when you hear it, I would say, this, you, when you sift through the statistics, it's about double in the military. As in, you know, set, rates of sexual assault are double in the military mm. compared mm. to civilian life. Yes? Do you have any information about World War II, um, about the history of the military? It seemed like it was World War II, um, uh, there was more people drafted. Um, there wasn't a quote unquote soldier type. Um, you mean in terms of sexual assault? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, they. The, the statistics on it only started to be gathered in the Vietnam War. Um, <clears throat> so I only know anecdotally, uh, and I know it happened because I've had, I've heard women who, who worked in the auxiliary army and so on mm -hmm. in World War II tell me about it. Um, and I've had women who served in Vietnam tell me about it. Mm. Um, but statistically, I can't compare, because as far as I know, there aren't the studies to do so. Uh, also, there weren't the same kind of numbers you know, in the military. And women were not allowed to carry weapons uh, until after Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So they also had very different roles in the war, in the wars beforehand. Mm -hmm. So one could argue perhaps they weren't as threatening because they weren't walking around trained with weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm guessing that. Yes. Um, I thank you for doing this and uh, I I heard you say earlier which I just think is good just to stop the wars would be a good great thing um, but I wanted to ask you just about um, this the second book you wrote Sand Queen yes and just to, if you could elaborate um, about the the victims and or the experiences of people from the, the countries of it being attacked Iraq. Yeah. It's set in Iraq, set in, in the beginning of the war in 2003, and it's set at the largest prisoner of war camp that we had there called Camp Buka. If any of you heard of Camp Buka? Uh, <clears throat> there was a huge prison that we built, actually the Brits built it, the other part of the we built it. <laughs> I say we, I can talk about both at once, I suppose. <laughs> we both conducted this war. Uh, it's right on the southern border, and it was just tents and Constantine wire, and we just did these huge sweeps of everybody, of everybody who seemed suspicious and all their neighbors and threw them in. So we had thousands of prisoners in there. Um, and that's where I set this. Uh, <clears throat> and it goes back and forth between a 19-year-old soldier from upstate New York, a rural girl called Kate, who's a prison guard, she's with the military police. And Naima, who was a medical student in Baghdad, and um, they fled the bombings, went south to their grandmother's house. American soldiers burst into the house one night and take her 13-year-old brother and her father, put them and take them off to the prison. So she starts walking there four kilometers every day, along with a lot of other Iraqis trying to find out what's happened to their men who were just swept up like this. And one day she and Kate meet at the checkpoint at the entrance. And she speaks English, Naima speaks English, as do many educated Iraqis. Um, and she sees an opportunity and she says to Kate, I'll help you translate and deal with this unruly mob if in return you look for my father and brother and tell me if they're all right and here's a picture. So that starts an interaction between them. <coughs> um, and the rest of it goes back and forth between Naima's story and her family and Kate's story. Um, <coughs> you know, a lot of Americans, I'm not sure if none of you uh, can be included in this, but didn't understand that you know Iraq was a secular country that the women were 50% of the students and 40% of the workforce, that women were doctors and lawyers mm -hmm. and engineers and professors. Um, in fact, of all the Muslim countries in the world, mm -hmm. women had more rights than any outside of Turkey in the whole Muslim world in Iraq. We, after, after Saddam was captured, 
um, and the imams and the more fundamentalist religious types took over. They wanted to revert to Sharia law and take away those rights, which had been encoded in 1959. And we, the Americans, said, righty ho, sign a dotted line. So we were large participants in rolling the rights of women way, way back in Iraq. And the literacy rate for women has plummeted for little, little girls now being kept out of schools, they are being married off temporarily, you know, for, for a day or two so that they can, you know, be used sexually and then divorced and sent oh, back. Temporary yes, temporary marriages is an Arabic word for it, but that's come back with a vengeance and um, you know, I mean, I'm certainly not saying that things were great under Saddam, but we have not improved mm -hmm. the situation in many ways for many people. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to get that across, and one of the things I did that surprises a lot of people is Naima, the Iraqi, is actually more educated than Kate, the American. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because it just, that's very, very likely. But a lot of Americans are like, oh wow, I didn't know that could happen. Because they just assume that the women are all illiterate at home and shrouded. And then it really? wasn't the case at all. No. Yes. Um, I had to type in the question because I don't want to get it. But, um, can they have potentially like, to prevent people who might uh, display uh, behaviors before they become, they become military, like a free screen, to see if they are potential rapists? Like, is there a way that they can be yeah. free screened? Uh, well, before the Iraq war, um, the military had all sorts of standards about uh, things that you could not, you know, the th not only physical standards you had to meet, but you could not go in if you had a felony and you had a conviction. You could not go in the military. And there are various other standards. There were, because during the Iraq war we were so desperate for bodies to send over there, because we already had a war going in Afghanistan, a lot of things were waived, those standards were waived. So they let in a lot more people with drug problems, with records, including men with records of domestic and sexual violence. Now some of those waivers have been put back in place, but not enough of them. And there certainly could be screening like that. Especially if anybody's been convicted, you can find out somebody's record quite easily. Mm -hmm. um, and there should be, and it's one of the recommendations in, in my book. I, I wonder, where is this film going now? I mean, what are the plans for it? Obviously, you want to get it shown. I mean, actually, I looked on Netflix to find it, and it wasn't there, of course, yet. No, not yet. It's so, really new. But, but where, what are the plans for the film? Well, it's and been released into the theaters in, in the different main cities all over the country. I know that. And it's available for places like this, you know. Uh, so, um, Do you just like that website? Is, you know, you can, you can um, write, you sort of, you rent it for a certain fee to be able to show. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, right, and if you're like, a community group or doing a neighborhood screen or something, it's less expensive. Yeah. Because yeah. wouldn't the University of Buffalo, for example, be yeah. If this, I mean, what? You know, yeah, you, you, you just go onto their website and mm -hmm. tells you how to do it. Yeah, invisible war that time. Yeah. 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 I mean, I'm going to call the university department mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. say, why aren't you calling them to get the film on the campus? Mm -hmm. oh my God. Yeah. We yeah. reached many, many, many more That's people. what they want. They want it. it should be a university campus. It's a lot of them here too. Army bases. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Air Force bases. Okay. Air Force bases. Yeah. All of them. Yeah. I have two comments. One, it should be at the high school, so we ain't got me. Yeah. They think that the high school is going to get proven, so that's right. Yeah. 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 Sure. Uh, uh, the high school is going to get proven. Rape is a hazard, so that's what I'm not going to get proven. And my second comment is, said that um, in military life is twice as much as the civilian life of those of the report similar here and the civilian life is most of the most of the people on reporting. Right. Um my question is it's not that we're twice as many are reported. I mean, to Wait. total number of, of sexual assaults and rapes is, but is double in the military. And, yeah. That, um, and the way just the, to hold that thought a minute okay. is to explain, you know, how do you count a rape that hasn't been reported? 
You do it by taking surveys of veterans who are no longer afra uh, afraid, they're not in the system anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get, you know, the hidden statistics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so my question would be, um, because that is, because of the style of what they're looking for in quality men, wouldn't that also, like the power and control thing, the, the power and control thing, wouldn't it be easier for men who are already being victimizing victims out here to go into a place where they know that it would be close quarters and that's probably yeah. where the numbers are double. I mean, there is, mm -hmm. I don't think there's any question that it's a voluntary military. It attracts predators, you know, among, among fine outstanding people, it also attracts mm -hmm. people who love violence, you mm -hmm. know, who want yeah. to kill mm -hmm. and hate yeah. women and, Psychos. you know, yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. It definitely attracts those. Um, you know, there's an inherent contradiction, though. I mean, the military isn't, it's a violent, it's an organization about violence. It's about teaching people to kill. Mm -hmm. So at the same time, you have to teach them not to be violent. You know? mm -hmm. And you have to say, okay, you can kill, but you can't rape. I mean, there is, mm -hmm. yes, there is deep down a complete nuttiness about this whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, so how much it can be rooted out, really? Well, that's really the, the big bottom line problem, isn't it? Most men and women join the military to prove their you know, readiness to fight. Yes. But a lot of young men go into the military to prove some sort of manhood, some machismo. You know, like your brother would say, you know, go into the military to make a man out of you. But yeah. it's, exactly. it's anything but. And I came across two incredible studies one of the Marines and one of the Army of recruits and child histories of childhood mm. uh, physical and sexual abuse. Mm. Half the women had been sexually abused. Really? And half the men, if I'm remembering the statistics right, uh, half the men had been physically abused as boys and many had been both. Mm. So a lot of people are joining the military to feel like they're not could never be victimized mm. again. Right. To get tough. And you right. can really understand that. But we know also from studies of what makes a rapist that mm -hmm. abused boys often turn into abusive men. Mm -hmm. And so there's that pattern going on as well. You had a question. Yeah, I just have a few questions. I was just wondering about, um, like, things brought up the like rape against civilians and, and places of warfare. And I was wondering if, um, like, is there any discussions or did many of the people you interacted with kind of made this connection between the rape culture that's used in war and also mm -hmm. being used against the soldiers themselves? Another question I wanted to yes. ask too is that, like, it's maybe something that with a lot of women being in male-dominated, you know, positions, you kind of ask to be, they often ask to be, these symbols of progress, and and related to the discussion about women having more increased role in war in, in in the military, like, how does this, I mean, this like you know, rape being a hazard of the job, kind of, how does that affect that discussion? And well, also one thing I want to point out with the World War II thing is that the yeah. most famous imagery of that, you know, of the celebration of B-Day, that man kissing that woman, yeah. is a depiction of sexual harassment. She yeah. didn't, yeah, she didn't consent to it. And really? Yeah. 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 Really? Wow. And he was at all. So, wow. so that's, that's, that's another thing about our culture and how what, what's celebrated. Um, um, well, there's a, of course there's an age, really an ancient tradition. You can see it in the Bible and you know in the oh, Greeks, yeah, yeah. where men are, I mean, women are, are booty. That's where that word comes from. <laughs> the soldiers, you know, rape, pillage, and rape and pillage. You know, we've all heard that. So women are seen as the prize for the conquering soldier, and that. The attitude towards women is incredibly pervasive in the military today as well, whether it be civilian women or their comrades. So that is, yes, that's a deep part of military culture. And I, I think it lies behind a lot of the denial that, and you know, sweeping under the carpet that we saw in the movie by commanders, because what they really think a lot of them is well, that's what women are for, and we deserve it because we're soldiers. So we don't really care. Um, the second part of your question, I didn't. Uh, I mean, two things. I'm sorry. It was, yeah. uh, but that one was about. I think there's always this occasional debate about women having more increased role in, in war in, in the battle. And um, I was wondering how this, you know, this issue of minority you know, being has with the occupation. Now. I mean, that's what they declared it. Yeah. Well, as I said, women, uh, I'm not sure if you were in the room, but women. Um, 
women have been joining in greater numbers since the recession hit. Whatever well, economic, mm -hmm. uh, it, even as there's been more attention to the the rape problem, so it doesn't seem to be deterring mm -hmm. any significant number of people. I think we, we really do need to hit the young in high schools. But you know, there's a big important other side to this equation. You can't go around telling people who have very little choices in life, no, don't take this job. Right. Unless you have an alternative to offer them. Yeah. Right. Right. You know, you get benefits, you get pay, you get, you know, in the military, you get your college paid for. Right. Uh, what are we going to tell them? It's that and McDonald's. So, um, well, that's, that's, that's the problem with the anti recruiting. Yeah, entrepreneurship. Great. Entrepreneurship. Great yeah. <laughs> something. Yeah. Because if you ask any of those women, I mean, some I've seen other side videos on um, on a news station. I think it was at MSNBC. But uh, most of them, would they take that back? Would they take their decision back to, if they knew that that was a thing? And so a couple of them said that they would have still won. But, but they all said, that. not for my kid, not the way it is now. Right. Right. Yeah. right. In this film, they said, in another film, it, yeah. like, a couple of them said that they would probably still make the decision to go because they wanted a help for serving the military. Right. But this is an experience that cuts through their whole life oh, yeah. And they can't take it away. Right. Yes. Do you see a correlation between the two older institutions, military and churches? The same no. guy, pardon, yes. Oh, yes. Sexual abuse, right. pedophile. Right. Yeah. Again, people who have a great deal of power over other people, sanctioned power with a huge power structure behind them, giving them that power, <laughs> and the denial and covering, covering wow. up. Oh, yeah, there's a big parallel there, for sure. I mean, perhaps, perhaps there are no, uh, no two institutions where the hierarchy of power is so rigid and so absolute as the military and the church. Oh, yeah. You know, like, you know, off, you know that, that hierarchy of power in the military, I mean, you, you know, as one of the soldiers said to me, you know, my commander, <coughs> the one who was raping me, he had the power to tell me when to eat or not eat, when to sleep or not sleep, when to work, when to go, when I could get vacation. I, he had absolute power over me and that was, that's the way it is and therefore, look what easy prey. You know, of course, of course you can still sue the church, but you can't sue the military. <laughs> yeah. There have been so many lawsuits against the church. Right. And they have paid the church. Church. Yeah, I mean, except for the relationship you know, between a, a priest and a little kid. But it doesn't have quite that rigid and hierarchy as you know, otherwise, mm -hmm. except at the top. <laughs> yeah. Of course. Oh yes. Um, LGBT issues, like uh, you know, in, in gathering the statistics for this, um, don't ask, don't tell was probably still in the books. Uh, so you know, encountering you know that you know that wall, like trying to get you know that uh, encountering that and like. I'm sure there are instances of like women who it was corrupted rape was what you know had, they were mm -hmm. up against. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, so you know the I, I, I will know. I mentioned it before the film, I don't know if you were here. Yeah, but, I was, but about yeah. yeah, there's it's a very important point because not only the as I said before, don't ask, don't tell Gaten officials method and sanction and bullying but statistically it was actually used to, to proportionally drive more women out of the military than men which given how fewer women there are is pretty remarkable it was used as a tool against anyone you know you saw as a rival or you didn't like uh, as you know regardless of whether she was actually a lesbian um, for revenge for anything um, so that was, it's really good that that's gone. But the, uh, yeah, that horrible, pernicious the idea that the corrected rape is, you know, it's, it's uh, used as an excuse, and you know, rape is a fair amount in the military. And, you know, as I said too at the beginning, everybody is, is labeled a bit to hoe or a dyke, and, you know, if you're a dyke, they're going to fix you. Mm -hmm.
Maybe we'll just do a couple more. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is your hand up? Oh, I was just grabbing you. Here, uh, as we're anti-war activists, we're always hearing uh, from church people and military people, uh, the Muslims don't respect life like we do. <laughs> and so I think you were saying you had a chance to talk to some of the Iraqi women. Do they face the same thing where uh, Iraqi men rape them during time of war, or do they not? What yeah, there aren't any Iraqi women soldiers, but the, but um, rape is a huge problem, as you know. In the, it's not so in much in the context of them being soldiers, but um, you know, when the society breaks down and gets more you know, gangs and militias and you know criminal gangs running loose, this is what happened, you know, in Baghdad after after our bombing. Uh, the rate of rape of women and girls went skyrocketing. It was mayhem there, <coughs> and kidnappings too, and you know, lots of criminal activity outside of religious strife, just people taking advantage of the mayhem. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a big problem, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a granddaughter, and I'd like to influence her but against going into the military. Mm -hmm. I'm not a veteran myself. So what, which one of those folks would be the do the best job? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, probably it depends whether she likes fiction or non-fiction better. Mm -hmm. uh, which kind uh, of book does she read, dear? You know? I say nonfiction. Well, then get on the lonely soldier. Some more. How much is it? I don't know. I'm not. I'm not the bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do the selling part. Does uh, the movie win any awards, or is it up for Yes, it, it won the audience award at Sundance, which oh, is a great lot. And it's a oh, uh, And I know it's up for some. I'm going to get the results later today. I have one more question. I mean, even in regards to, as you had mentioned before, that uh, it's uh, militaries across the world tend to be uh, even more secretive than ours. Is there any sort of demonstrable um, statistics that might say that uh, this country may have like the lowest rate of sexual harassment and or rape at this point? Or can we presume that all of them are pretty much on the same? I don't think we can presume in anything because they haven't, if they haven't had the studies, I could not guess. The movie did point out that there are a lot of our NATO allies that have already stopped the commanders from having discretion over whether to prosecute, so they're ahead of us in those ways. But we can't say that any one country may have like the lowest rate in the world for... No, no. there have not been no studies on that. Right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Wants to be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>